uh, yeah, so we're supposed to wait for someone else, someone else, but uh, maybe we can start now, I think, if we want to be on time. Uh, so, uh, so well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, round table about uh, the usage of uh, models. Uh, now it's been uh, three days since we are beginning this uh, workshop and since we have seen um, the presentation of many, many models uh, with uh, diverse application domains, with uh, diverse type of context and uh, different types of uh, models. Uh, but uh, there is a, a question that uh, we wanted to, to ask uh, during this one table is uh, the status of uh, now the agent-based modeling. Um, I mean by that, is it now a recognized and mainstream approach or not really? And why? What? Uh, what is the uh, and, and about the use of agent-based model? I mean, now it's become uh, easier and easier to to build agent-based models, and I think this workshop is a proof that now large agents are able to build agent-based modeling using tools, existing tools. But is it has it become easier, really easier to use? And what are the necessary skills or knowledge to be able to build agent-based modeling? I mean, is it is everyone is able to build a model? So does uh, is it necessary to have some basic knowledge? And so another question that we wanted to to ask is was about uh, integrated models uh, because we are more and more speaking about uh, building integrated models that couples many sub models uh, with different formalism, them, but. Uh, in what is the place of agent-based model inside this integrate inside this integrating models? What are their specificities? And finally, uh, what are the main challenges, uh, current challenges, and future challenges concerning agent-based modeling? And so, to talk about this question, so we have the, we are very pleased to have. Uh, several experts in uh, agent-based uh, modeling. So first of all, we have uh, Andrew Crooks, who is a professor in the Department of Geography of the University of Buffalo in the US. So he's working on uh, so many things, and in particular is uh, using different approaches, such as uh, spatial analysis, social network analysis, and of course, agent-based model to study uh, complex social economic systems and more specifically, specifically urban systems. And uh, also, uh, if you are interested by the topics of spatial simulation, he has a very interesting blog about the subject. And finally, he's uh, implicated in the development of the Mason uh, Toolkit, which is a very powerful tool to develop AD. Uh, we have also Arno Grigna, so he is a researcher at the MIT Media Lab and is currently working at the Litis Laboratory also at the University of Lyon in France. So he's now is used to work with uh, researchers that are not computer scientists because uh, so the group that is part at the MIT is the City Science Group, uh, which is composed mainly of uh, urban planner and architects. And uh, Arno is working on uh, visualization and user interaction with simulations. So in particular, he's working uh, recently more on physical uh, of ton uh, on tangible interface to interact with simulations. So I think he has uh, an interesting uh, point of view on the use of uh, agent-based models. And so for the moment, we, we were supposed to have one more uh, expert, but uh, Alexi is going to be the third one. So Alexi Rogul, uh, that uh, I think everybody knows. So it's a uh, researcher, senior researcher at IRD. So it's worked uh, now for a long time on agent-based simulation and modeling, and uh, he's uh, so the coordinator of the Gamma platform. So he has think a lot about how to make agent-based modeling uh, visible by uh, a large audience. So to 
go to go back to your questions. Uh, so the first question will be about your use of agent-based model. So what kind of so what type of application for what type of application are you using agent-based models? Uh, in which context? I mean by that is a very purely scientific context or with uh, stakeholders for decision making or as pedagogical tools or, or other context. And uh, yeah, for what type of applications? So maybe uh, so we can start with uh, you, Andrew, if it's okay for you. Yes, no problem at all. Um, so, um, you know, to give some context, I've been de developing ABMs for maybe the last 20 years now. I feel old, really old, getting old now on this. And, um, you know, I, I use agent based models for many different applications, anything from the micro movement of pedestrians over seconds to um, urban growth and migration. So, more macro scale models over years and years and decades. Um, and although um, Patrick mentioned that, you know, a lot of the work I do is sort of GIS based ABMs, that is very true. But we've also done lots of other types of um, agent-based models. And that's one thing I find fascinating about ABMs is that it's uh, they sort of pur, pur, um, getting their feet in the door in many different application areas. So a lot of work we've been doing recently is on like opinion dynamics, especially with say um, vaccine sentiment and like, and you know, and uh, like are people pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine. Um, and and then other applications um, in in um, um, I guess sort of disease models is another area that we're currently working in. But I guess most of the models that we are developing do have some type of geographical spatial location, and the agents interact with each other. The environment and migrant patterns come out like many of the presentations from the Gamma workshops. Then the last few days, I was looking at the abstracts before coming into, into today's meeting. Um, yeah, so nearly anything, any aspect we can explore it, using agent-based models. Thanks, Arno. So <clears throat> first of all, hi to everyone. Um, I think I'm very happy also to meet you virtually, Andrew. Uh, as um, maybe you don't know, but you have lots of influence actually in uh, what has been impl implemented in Gamma. I was reading a, a lot, I'm still reading a lot of your paper that was very, very uh, inspiring about anything related to cities, GIS. And uh, I have this paper that I am always reading the, the key challenging in uh, agent-based uh. for geospatial simulation. I, I recommend to all of you to read some of Crook's paper that are very well uh, written and with lots of sources. And uh, so, yeah, that's great. And Alexi, uh, of course, I'm also very happy to share this session with you. Um, so to answer to Patrick's question, maybe let me give you some very quick uh, background about how did I discover IBM. So I have been introduced to IBM by, uh, by Alexi, which was actually my, uh, my PhD uh, supervisor in tw from 2011 to 2015. And at this time, we, we mainly, uh, the main focus, focus of our research was about uh, visualization, as uh, Alexi was mentioning in uh, his talk. Uh, that's where we started to implement it, some uh, new feature in Gamma in terms of visualization, but also in, in terms of interaction with mainly the integration of the, the 3D displays. So me, I was more like kind of in a generic approach, uh, developing the platform, but not really yet with some applied uh, project. The goal was really to, to develop a generic methodology on the usage in general about the visualization and interaction in the agent-based world. And uh, so after that, after my PhD, so I joined the, the MIT Media Lab City Science Group where uh, it became much more applied. Actually, I, I took in my bag uh, Gamma and uh, the agent-based uh, approach, and I bring it to this, uh, this lab that was focusing on more like urban planning and tangible simulation uh, problems. Uh, so I joined the, the CityScope group, which uh, was made mainly about with architects and designers. So the, the kind of challenge 
was to introduce and to use some ABM uh, methodology in, a, let's say, a non-computer scientist uh, community. So that's, uh, I think that was a kind of challenge for three main reasons. First of all, the, the question the model had to ask was kind of a bit unusual uh, because it was coming from urbanists, from designers. Uh, one of the first applications of ABM was to try to characterize the interaction between city, like depending on your uh, configuration, how vibrant, how potential interaction you can build inside your cities. So here, uh, using ABM uh, and having agent representing people was pretty powerful. Uh, the second challenge was to also to develop some model that would be simple enough to, to, be, to be broadcasted, but also simple enough to be reused. One of the challenge was to have uh, some bricks that could be uh, reused easily in the Gamma platform by other researchers and students. So there was a kind of trade-off between the simplicity of the model and uh, the accuracy of it. And the third challenge also is that most of those models, they were meant to be uh, displayed on a physical interface. So um, there was a lot of effort and that was something kind of new for me on the, the real time uh, part. So those models needed to be, uh, to be uh, reactive and uh, with a lot of kind of visual uh, uh, design uh, question that raised uh, many questions uh, on Gamma uh, GitHub issues about how to enhance uh, visually those, uh, those, uh, those models. So that's main, mainly my use of ABM really, so let's say applied to urbanism, but much more applied to visualization in general. So using a, a simulation to animate some uh, graphical uh, objects. Alexi? Yeah, I've, I've almost forgotten the question since, uh, <laughs> since <laughs> the beginning, but, but it's okay. Uh, no, I pro I'm probably the worst uh, agent-based model user in the world because uh, I know wh what is inside, actually. So it's absolutely terrible to know, to know it and to use it. Um, my, my point of view would, will be more about, um, uh, I would say, a software engineering point of view. Uh, I, I, I think agent-based approaches, wh whatever their names, uh, are just a way to see and represent the world. And actually, we have uh, the chance to have been able to operational, uh, operationalize them on computers, okay? And quite powerful computers to be able to animate and, and, and do things with them. But for me, it's really a, a way to, 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 to see the world. And, and actually, uh, I think that, and it is something I said two days ago in, at the end of my presentation, but more and more, we will probably forget about agent-based we will talk about modeling, but forget about the agent-based parts uh, for, for one reason, because it's exactly what happened to the object-oriented approach in software engineering. Okay. At, at one time, it was all, all, all the fuzz and, and everyone was talking about object orientation of the software and how nice it was, etc. And then it became mainstream. And actually now it's very, very unusual to find languages which don't offer some object-oriented approaches. And for me, Agent orientation will follow exactly the same path. Also because, and I will f finish on this, uh, I think the questions asked to modelers have evolved a lot in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, and probably Andrew will agree, agree with me, but uh, now uh, the, the question asked to, let's say, agent-based modeling uh, are uh, much more complex than 20 years ago. Uh, because they concern the evolution of social environmental system with a lot of dynamics. And actually a lot of them are, there is no interest in using agents to represent them. We can use agents to wrap them or to couple them, but not to represent them by, uh, I don't know, ideologic uh, um, uh, dynamics, for example, or things like this. There is no interest in using agents to represent them. So. So I think we, we are evolving towards the, the, the yeah, disappearance of agents <laughs> because it will become so mainstream and so basic to use them that, um, well, we will forget we, we have ever used them once. So there is no more challenge then. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, Andrew, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think it's uh, yeah, it's interesting yeah. that Alexis is saying that uh, there will be no more ABM in a few years, but that's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Patrick, if we're going to go off off your questions here, but I think what Alexi mentioned about ABMs, like maybe people will stop talking about Asian based modeling as a methodology, is quite interesting because, yeah, you're right, the object oriented programming analogy, you know, back 15 years ago, 20 years ago, so, you know, all it when you wrote those papers about what is ABM, and I know you guys have done this as well, you talk about object oriented programming and things like that. Now we don't write about those types of things, which is which is to some extent nice, quite nice really. Um, but also I think it's really wonderful that you don't have to, when you go to a conference or a workshop or, or now, one doesn't have to spend the first 15 minutes or five minutes of a presentation talking about what agent-based modeling is. A lot of people have heard about it. I mean, when I first started doing this in, in like the regional science community, you know, they were like, why bother? Why not just use traditional aggregate spatial interaction models? And it's wonderful to see ABM sort of becoming more mainstream and, and actually integrated in sessions rather than having their own specific sessions sometimes at like the Association of American Geographers Conferences, um, but being more, more mainstream. So yeah, I, I echo some of your thoughts, thoughts there, Alexi. I think, yes, very good. So maybe just to, to argue a bit with Alexi, I think, I mean, I agree with you that maybe it's meant, and it goes back maybe, uh, Patrick, to the question about uh, is uh, ABM mainstream now? Uh, I would say it's mainstream in the, let's say, the computer science uh, field. But if I try to be a bit provocative, I, I hope it won't disappear uh, that uh, fast in the non-computer science uh, community, because I think it's still a methodology which is pretty easy to explain with the analogy of uh, agent uh, attribute reflex like all those uh, uh, the way to explain uh, let's say real system um, so i think it's not yet mainstream in uh, if you if you take some some domain like architecture or design or even art or pure uh, generative approach uh, I think there is still some work to 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 make it to make it ma mainstream. So, I think the um, yeah I don't know about the 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 I think in the computer science it's even maybe more than mainstream and for some community even a bit outdated. But still in the in the in the non uh, computer science I think it's really the the beginning and actually people are very kind of. Uh, uh, surprise, curious about what can be done with this, uh, and maybe sometimes they think that everything can be done with this, and it's maybe our role, and that's the kind of discussion we had uh, yesterday in the keynote, in the roundtable about uh, the validity of the model. But uh, yeah, that's my kind of uh, of answer to the the mainstreamness of the the ABM. But you, yeah, Alexis, so you, you think really that so now uh, agent-based modeling is really mainstream because uh, in many for for many uh, many many other colleagues from different uh, coming from different fields, uh, when I when you speak about agent-based modeling, it means nothing. And uh, I will speak more about uh, when you are speaking to I mean uh, to someone that is not a uh, scientist, when you are speaking about uh, modeling, uh, you are speaking about artificial intelligence, deep learning, okay, so everybody uh, know what is, uh, not really know, but have an idea of what is it. But when you are speaking uh, about agent-based modeling, it means that's nothing for, for most of people. So what, what, what you mean by, about that, how to promote agent-based modeling, is necessary to promote it, and how to promote it to uh, this uh, modeling approach? Yeah, I, I guess um, Andrew summarized it very well. Actually, it's um, so maybe it's a little bit provocative to say that it will disappear and just vanish like that. Of course not. It will be the foundation of the next generation simulation tools we are going to use, because like object oriented orientation, it doesn't impose any formalisms. Actually. You, you can represent uh, mathematical uh, dynamics, well, dynamics that you express in, in mathematical language. Uh, you, you can use agents to, to just support this representation, and it, it, it's okay. I mean, an agent with a mathematical uh, uh, dynamic, it, it's perfectly okay. So 
the, the thing is that it does not, it, it's a way to, for, for me, it's, uh, I completely agree with Arno. It's very interesting to use it uh, in, to, to explain maybe to explain um well it's a way to 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 find the components in a very complex problem to find and isolate the components so that people can understand uh, how to, to to build them and how to model them uh, it's a way to see the world uh, in and basically uh, we we will continue to use it so when i say it will vanish it will vanish exactly like andrew says it will vanish as a kind of uh so maybe not in every in every domain but as a kind of thing that uh, the, the the two three paragraph you you are forced to write uh, at the beginning of every paper saying what is an agent <laughs> what is ibm what is uh, at some point you you don't see any more paper in software engineering that begin with what is an object and what is a method and what is inheritance and what is specialization etc and and for me it will vanish a little bit like that um but it doesn't mean it will disappear actually uh, it will be less visible or less uh, put forward but uh, it will not it will not disappear and uh, and it's true you, you're completely right but that's why i say i'm a very bad user because I, i'm actually i live in agents okay so so it's complicated for me to to say it's not mainstream but but, but you're completely right. In some domains, it's totally still very very new and very probably very interesting also. To learn. Yeah, I'm fo following up on that. So when I was, before going to come to the University of Buffalo, I was at George Mason University in a program called Computational Social Science, and in that program, mainly PhD and masters, um, you know, we were using computational tools to solve social science questions, and that one of the, the one of the, the big tools would be in the agent based mod, mod agent based modeling. So I, you know, um. Hello, Alexi. So I, I was ingrained in agent-based models, but every you know, I'm used to joke to the students um, that um, it would be lovely not to have to spend one or two paragraphs every paper justifying why one has to use agent-based modeling against another modeling methodology. So if you were doing, say, um, econ economics ABM, right? Rather than saying why you're not doing simple econometrics types of modeling, why have you chosen ABM? If you're doing a disease model, why are you not using this traditional um, 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 SIRI types of models, mathematical models? Or um, if you're doing operations research, why are you not using uh, uh, system dynamics types of models? And I, my, the, the previous comment that I, that I was sort of building off my Alexa about not having to justify what or object oriented programming was, was literally that type of analogy, which is, it'd be lovely not to have to spend, you know, your several paragraphs justifying why you've chosen this approach. And I think that is happening more and more in certain areas, not every area. There are still some fields right, uh, that I think are sort of resistant to agent-based models, economics, especially, right, main, mainstream economics, is still relatively re um, resistant to that. But, you know, I think it's like ABM is slowly chipping away at many traditional modeling methodologies and also being introduced in, in new areas. So um, next week, or, uh, sorry, no, in July, sorry, we have a workshop or panel at the um, at a business conference on agent-based modeling and how we can use agent-based modeling in human resources. So, and, you know, this is not... This is definitely not mainstream. It's not very widely used, but you know, slowly you, we can, you're getting more and more buy-in into different areas of application with respect to what you can use agent-based models for. And I think that's really quite in, that's really something that's you know growing over and over time. Arno, you wanted to add something? No, I mean I've I. I, it's something we quickly put on the table and I mean, it can be maybe a kind of bomb. I don't, I don't have the answer, but I would be happy to have uh, Andrew and Alexi a point of view uh, on this. Is there a potential link between, uh, let's say, the ABM world and this big buzz about uh, AI, machine learning, uh, not to mention deep learning? So me, that's something I have been exposed a lot, uh, especially spending five years in US. 
And actually, I didn't find the answer yet. Uh, I hope it exists, but is there some way to make some link, to make it uh, complementary? Uh, that's something that I would be interested to have your point of view, uh, Andrew and Alexi. If you have, I know it's maybe a difficult question, uh, but me, I clearly don't have the answer, but uh, it would be interesting to have your point of view on that. I did actually have some notes I, I, with the questions that um, Patrick sent out, you know, like where, where the, you know, what are the next challenges with respect to ABM? I was going to mention AI, actually. Okay. So, um, so I'm happy to talk about that now, if you'd like. Uh, well, you brought it up, so we should really, right? <laughs> hey, go ahead. So, no, no, it goes back to, uh, I think, Alex, Alexi mentioned that, you know, ABMs are becoming much more complicated and in what one got a phd in abm and gis to, when i did mine would today be like a class project at school now because the tools are so much easier to develop especially the things like gamma i uh, some of my students have actually used gamma in the in the past um um and that logo and things like that. so it's super easy to build but you know there is all this buzz and you know especially in the us with respect to ai and, and machine learning and we've been exploring sort of this and i um in the, like we the argument or the argument of the, the analogy we put forward is that in abm there's sort of three phases to the agent-based model you've got the design of the model looking at the data if you want to use data to inform the model right that's that stage and then the rule, like what are the main attributes? Then you've got the going on, what goes on inside the model, the like the decision making of the agents and the behavior, which is sort of the key thing that most of us are really interested in. And then you've got the model outputs. And the problem with agent based models, the model outputs can be huge, especially if you're looking at the like, like all the different agents interacting with each other, where they're interacting, um, you know, the trajectories they've taken. Um, and you know, so, and I think machine learning can be used in all of the three aspects, building the model, actually inside the model with respect to agent learning. And I know you guys in Gamma have done some really good stuff on um, it, learning, they sort of learning pieces with inside of agent-based models. Like, I think you have a BDI, BDI toolkit or linkage, right? And I know that you had some other, um, presentations this week is it was it was it uh, beds um yeah ben sorry um and things like that right and then so yeah so we can use machine learning techniques to mine data or ai if you want to cut to that to help understand really what should be the real um, pat the parameters or patterns one should put into the agent based model so it machine learning to inform what goes on is into the model. My big pet peeve of agent-based modeling is what, what is a, one of the key criteria that you see banded around all the time is agent learning. Agents learn from their experiences and they adapt and things like that. But often now the learning in agent-based modeling is relatively simple. I mean, this is more reactive, you know, in the segregation model of shelling. If an agent, you know, you move if your preferences are not met, but you don't really learn from that move you just keep moving unlike say brian arthur's health role problem going to the bar in santa Fe, where you base your um probability of going to the bar based on past experiences so you remember things in the past but i think machine learning methods could be used there things like um reinforcement just various reinforcements like qq q learning or sasa learning and things like that I think, you know, but then it does bring up the question, um, which is machine learning models are sort of optimization types of problems, right? So you're trying to optimize or maximize some type of payoff and do, and do this. But I, people really, max, you know, that goes against some of the thought that people are not really um, optimize. We don't really optimize anymore, like satis satisfies. Um, but I think one of the really interesting areas is using machine learning methods for the agents to learn. And you see those, you see in lots and lots more papers now being developed with respect to using a specific machine learning technique. Normally, Q learning seems to be one of the most ones in the vogue at the moment. Um, 
and how and then doing something like um i know ed manley was doing like ta- uh, root choice in london using taxi data and things like that using um, q- um q learning and then other people like looking at the invasive species uh, uh, but one of the problems i i have with the learning bit with inside the agencies people are just using one machine learning method and you know in the data science community if you are looking at some type of data you don't use one method you throw the whole kitchen sink of methods SVNs, um different types of um convolutional neural network or whatever you throw a whole bunch at the data and see who gets the best result you do not have that yet happening in the agent based modeling community you want pe- people are just using one method and seeing how it comes out and I know this only because we had, I had a PhD student back at Mason and we tried a variety of different machine learning methods within the sugar scale model by Epstein and Axtell. And different machine learning methods will give you different results. But people haven't really explored that. And they, you know, it, and I guess this is, this is one of the challenges of just implementing these machine learning methods. So toolkits like Gamma, Mason, NetLogo could be useful if they could develop, you know, machine learning methods, simple plug and play machine learning methods that you could plug in to your agent based model. I don't know if Gamma has that yet. Uh, uh, some plugins to help to store, for, uh, at least for supervised running, but for, uh, um, I think if you just want to implement Q running, it's quite, quite, quite easy. You don't have to need to go them, it's quite easy to, to, to implement some. But after, uh, I will let maybe Alexi speak about, but for me, the problem of learning techniques inside agent-based models is to, did you lose the um, interpretability of the of the decision of the agent? So it's not possible to, 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 to be able to understand why an agent make a decision or not with, uh, if you are using some machine learning techniques for agent to, that will be able to learn, right? Maybe it's possible, but it can be very difficult. So maybe it's because for me, one of the interests of the agent-based modeling is to be able to understand how agent, our agents are going to make decisions. Sometimes, but I will let Alexi uh, maybe correct. Yeah, too late. You already said what I wanted to say. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, uh, I compl- first I completely agree with Andrew that the two, uh, let's say, worlds of techniques are, are completely complementary. I mean. You can, you can use machine learning and a lot of different machine learning techniques in every stage of building, using, experimenting, exploring a model. And, 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 it, and it, it's developing, actually. You, now we, we have more and more optimization techniques used for calibrating models, uh, for uh, exploring uh, the, the outcomes of models. Etc. So, so for me, it's completely normal, actually, to, to use them as, uh, for example, optimization techniques. Uh, it's also, um, I think, quite in- interesting to use them within models uh, when, when the question you want to answer is, for example, uh, does the adaptation of individual people um, uh, lead to something interesting collectively? Uh, so when, when the mechanism itself is uh, uh, part of the question you want to, to ask to your model, then, then I think it's really interesting to, to use them and to use, uh, uh, so it can be Q-learning, it can be different things. And of course, it's like behavioral model. Not all um, formal learning formalism or mechanism we will be able to correctly represent how people learn for them or how they adapt or, or anything. Um, for, but for me, the, there is no. Um, so it's two worlds which have a lot in common uh, um, and are a lot complementary. But actually, when when you're using. Um, uh, when, when, when you're using machine learning and on one hand you, you're building models, for, for me, you're answering, or may, maybe you can address the same problems, but, but you, you, will, you will answer completely differently. And one of the differences, and Patrick, you're completely right on that, is the explanation. I mean, agent-based models are mechanistic models. We, we can, even if it's complicated and sometimes very, very, very yeah, complicated to do, um, and it requires a lot of resources, we, we, we can completely uh, draw the chain of uh, causality from what happens in one part of the model to what happens at the end uh, in the outcomes. There is emergence, of course, etc., but there is no magic, okay? Uh, so no, nothing appears by, ma- by magic. So, so it means that we, we can reconstruct it. 
in, in many uh, machine learning new techniques, okay, uh, all, all the ones based on neural networks and uh, convolution networks, etc. Uh, you can't, okay. So the, 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 you you have to accept the result, and you have to accept maybe some I don't know prediction over uh, whatever phenomenon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you you can't simply um, understand the causality and maybe what should be changed at some point uh, to avoid uh, whatever consequence you want, you want to avoid. So for me, the, the big difference is here, and it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It, it just means that sometimes you need to understand the causality, and sometimes you don't, okay? Uh, I mean, uh, when I want to recognize or, or make sure that I can recognize a, 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 an image of a cat on, on the web, I don't care how it is recognized, okay? and, and I mean, I absolutely don't care about this. So, so it's completely different tasks, in my opinion, and uh, but quite complementary whenever uh, we, we need to use both. Well, no, I don't know. Well, Andrew, if you want to react. No, I mean, yeah, I knew it would be a, an interesting discussion. But me, I hear a lot, uh, some people that say, OK, I have lots of data. Uh, I want to train your IBM model. Uh, and I just give you the data. You train your model, and you will extract the behavior. And that, that was the kind of question I was asking is that is it some, for me, it's always uh, difficult to answer. It's like, as I speak a lot with architects, it's like, it's not because you give me 100 type of building that I will uh, be able to extract how to generate those buildings. So it was more in this kind of link, if it's something that can be explored, but maybe you you answered a bit with the Q learning of this kind of approach. But the, the simple question is that if you have a huge, if we focus on mobility, like this yesterday session was a lot about mobility in an ABM approach, uh, defining behavior, uh, mode choice, and all this kind of approach. What if you have a kind of ground truth data set where you have all the paths of every people? How difficult is it possible to, uh, to make it simple, to convert it in a reflex in gamma? I think that's where the, there is some confusion in, the, in those two worlds that are uh, maybe two different worlds, as Alexis says. So me, this link is still something that I am questioning. questioning. See, uh, raise your hand. Uh, you have something to say? Yes, I didn't do it by chance. Uh, yeah, I uh, <laughs> no, I, I I really think that in the in the new okay machine learning or big data um, world, uh, there, there is really this kind of uh, fantasy, and uh, and actually it's not a fantasy sometimes, but that that the machine and the computer will build your model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you feed it with data, and at the end you will have a model, which is right actually. Okay, we you you have a model. There is somewhere a model of a cat, a model of a dog, etc. Even if we can't understand what it is, and but uh, and ABM, it's a really constructivist uh, approach where actually you you are asked as uh, experts on anything to to build models. Okay? And, and for me, one of the main uh, differences is, is more here, is the fact that when building models, people learn something. Okay. Uh, a, a lot of the interest of ABM, for me, is not really in uh, having uh, computer programs called ABM running on the machine. It's what happens before, actually. What happens before with people, with uh, stakeholders, with experts, with uh, people exchanging uh, from different domains, etc. Et and this part, uh, I think that well, a lot of my motivation to build a platform like Gamma is precisely uh, that, to have people collaborating on this and, and maybe creating new knowledge together. So, and this part is completely hidden, actually. Uh, well, not completely hidden, but it doesn't appear anywhere um, in, in, uh, in, in the program sometimes. So um, but that's the main difference for me, having the machine build the model and building the model yourself, which is uh, a big difference. Oh. There, was a there was a big program one, one time in, in DAPA 
um, what we call big, me big mechanicity, where their aim was to actually build models from mining all the data, especially textual data, and come up with a rule set. But it didn't um, necessarily, it, you know, there's a nice simple proof of concept, but it never became mainstream. But people are, you know, people are exploring all many different things. But going back, I know your comment about act, 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 you know, people coming to you, I have all this data, build, you know, build me a model. And and then going back to what Alex said mentioned, you know, it data is not the answer to to I don't data's great. And you know, as a PhD student, I was mesmerized by data, right? And we did this and this and this. And then I in quickly learned that you can't do everything. The data you might have too much data or the data might not be the right thing for you. Um also there's a big challenge with data which is the outer sample type of thing, right? And there's a, I, there's a quote I liked, and I, I'm, I, I'm looking at the internet, I, can't, I can never remember quotes, but there's a quote by um, a Greek philosopher, Heraclitus, and it's like, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. What that means is, and it's a bit like data. So one of the big questions we get asked a lot especially in the DC metro area because of the um, the people in that area, the governments and things like that, is, you know, predict this with this data. Mm -hmm. And I like to, you know, you can train a machine learning model on data and you can improve your predictions potentially. But, you know, if you train, I used to use the analogy of the 2009 financial or 2008 financial um collapse right it would be very easy to train a model on the housing market up until 2008 but because we've never seen a 2008 housing market crash your model would your data would fail to to do that it would fail to predict it right but you know there there are theories there are ideas with respect to housing market bubbles and things like that that we can incorporate and explore with explore and then maybe help infuse that with data. I don't know if data is always going to be the solution to everything. I still think it's very important. I think what you both are sort of alluding to is ideas and what goes on inside of the ABM is still super important. And and like you know, I can't, I can't remember who said it, you know building agent based models is more of an art than a science. I think it was Axel Rod who, who said that. Um, and I still think that's true today. Um, as it was um, when Axelrod wrote it, was in 97, right? I think he advanced the out of simulation, I think it was, it was in. Um, and yeah, so I, I do like using uh, the idea of machine learning, but I'm also curious about the data. But that goes back to, you know, what is the utility of agent-based modeling? I think, um, I know, uh, um, you know, you may, I think you sort of, uh, and uh, Alexi, you both mentioned, I think agent-based models are very good for explanation and exploring different things. Um, and we, we need, you know, we shouldn't forget that, especially in this e era of data. Uh, exactly. So yeah, maybe that could be a, a good paper to, to write together. <laughs> I think I think this question. But I mean, maybe we should uh, we should maybe move. For, there was lots of other question. Maybe we spend too much time speaking. No, 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 not okay. It's, it's open discussion, so we don't care about the questions. Uh, just uh, one one thing because you you mentioned that uh, one day uh, so an architect gave you a lot of data to build the models, but why the architect didn't build the model uh, by himself? I mean, <laughs> because I I think it goes back to the fact that ABM is not that mainstream. So they think that uh, the model will learn. So maybe it's a lack of communication from our community. Uh, so that, that goes back, I think, to the, the way we explain it. And for pure non-computer uh, scientists, I think it's, uh, it can be uh, difficult to, to understand how, how it is. But I mean, that's, uh, that's a, long, uh, a long question. But most of the time, people think that our ABM model can be trained by data and especially in mobility because we have lots of telecom data and uh, so now i have some uh, good uh, way to answer to these questions thank you andrew and alexi but yeah but just, just to go back uh, do you think it's part of in your 
experience with architects and urban planners, it will, it will have been possible to just tell them, okay, we are going to, you, you can build your own models with uh, some tools that can be used, uh, but so complex to use. And uh, I will uh, maybe train you to, uh, to give you some of the basis just to be able for, uh, to build your model by yourself. Or it's something, it's, it's the problem conceptual about uh, agent based modeling is a concept are too complex to understand, or it's about the uh, right technical stuff like uh, programming. Go go ahead, Andrew. I, I don't. So, you know, I've been teaching sort of ABM for the last ten years or so in, in in the US, and I've taught everyone from sort of archaeologists, anthropologists, all the way up to transportation planners. I never taught. I needed someone who's done zoology. I never had a zoologist yet, but I've you know I've taught the we've taught the spec. I've taught the spectrum, so, social work including social work, right? So I've taken people who are computer scientists and I've taken so social scientists, I've you know, physical scientists to build, to build models. And people are getting much better at programming these days. Programming is becoming more mainstream, more mainstream like in nearly every discipline, especially with Python now. Um, and, you know, you know, and I know there's also toolkits now being developed in Python. Um, with respect with respect to uh, and so so I think one thing is people are becoming more competent using programming languages so it's easier for them to pick up the agent based models but one thing people don't realize especially people who see an agent based model especially the, the ones that you the visuals that you make I know which are like you know they're stunning right so people see them and like oh that's great it probably didn't take you that long to make them right and that's what they that's what they think but building models is still very time consuming. So normally in the US, we have a 15 week semester. And at the end of the semester, at the beginning of the semester, I'm like, right, we're gonna, at the end of the semester, you're gonna develop a model and present it to class. You know, unlike doing a history essay or a essay in general, it, um, you know, you can't leave the last minute. Building ABMs it takes time. I know with tools now, like, like Gamma and things like that, it's, it's quicker to build models, right? But it's still, takes a while to conceptualize the model, to implement it, verify it, things like that. It's, it's, you know, and people just don't realize how time consuming models are. And I think it's very simple to create a very simple model, like a proof of concept, but then applying that to a real world situation and then actually maybe getting stakeholder involvement and, and, and whatnot, it, it's super, super time consuming. And people, I still don't realize that, that you know, often I get asked, Oh, just build me a model of that. You know, it'll take you a week or two. And I'm like, no, it could take me months. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, so. There is expectations that we might need to have to help clarify. I'm sort of going off on a tangent here, but I know sort of prompted me to that tangent. Um, yeah, no, no, yeah, you, yeah, and I, I, actually, I can be the one to blame. Like you, you, I think you're right about visualization. You can have like a very simple model, and with some small visualization trick to make it as it's very complex. And that's where, and I mean, that's the kind of argue that I had a lot uh, about visualization in ABM. Do you do you need to visualize them? What do you show? Uh, what is the the, the boundary between the what exactly the the, the agent are doing versus what you are showing uh, so yeah that's always a, an open question yeah me I am a bit extreme on visualization but sometimes uh, that's some part of the question we were I don't know Patrick if I'm trying to follow a bit the the challenging and like I, I and, and maybe here it's speaking to the gamma uh, uh, presenter that were here today and I am also the first one to do that most of the time you create a spaces you want to visualize it because you spend time to to define the reflex the attribute so it's like okay I want to visualize it but you you might end up with too much information and I think that's where uh, to go back in the the next challenge and uh, uh, how can we improve the the ABM framework is is proposing and working together on some very simple way to, to visualize the information that really goes straight to the to the point and trying to summarize it. And again, I'm the first one to blame 
where sometimes I make some model with lots of moving dots. And at the end, it's like, okay, but okay, there is a lot of stuff moving, but what is really happening? So like building those abstraction on top of uh, complex behavior, I think it's uh, something interesting also, yeah. Alexi? Mm, yeah, ju just want to, to point out that the users are changing a lot. And actually, uh, the users we have now are not the, the ones we had 20 years ago when there were no smartphones, where uh, nobody was playing SimFarm, where nobody was playing, uh, well, not SimCity because it's old, but all the simulation games, for example, they have completely changed the way people um, uh, accept to represent some part of the reality. And, mm -hmm. and now what I, what I see, but again, I'm probably not the best one to speak about it, but what, what I see when I discuss also with people from different domains, is that the, the concepts of agent-based modeling are super simple to, to, to understand immediately. Okay, they, they, they really correspond to things we, we can see. And uh, there are agents in the world, I don't know who said that yesterday, but okay, we can represent them. And, it's, and people accept much more than before, for example, to give behavior to inanimate objects. Uh, or um, uh, all, all the video games are, <laughs> have, been, have been changing the way people see part of the reality and accept to represent it. So it doesn't mean it's a good right thing every time, but at least uh, I think that there is a, a kind of cultural gap we, which has been uh, completely bridged. I think. And um, after that, the role of visualization here, um, I mean, yes, but it's not, uh, you're, you're right in saying that maybe we can falsely represent things and, and represent dynamics that actually don't occur in the, in, in the model itself, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I mean, there, there are two sides. For, for me, there are two, 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 two answers to that. The first one is that it's not something which is uh, specific to ABM. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, ask architects. <laughs> you have worked with architects. I mean, ask architects to, to build you a model of what they are going to, to, to build in a few years. It's always beautiful. It's always sunny when they, when they do... Uh, I don't know, the Champs-Élysées in the next 20 years, it's always sunny. Uh, girls have uh, short skirts, etc. Et so, you, you, I mean, <laughs> it's, you, of course, we use visualization to convince people. Mm -hmm. One way to convince them. And, and when you build a model, it's one way to convince them and maybe also to, 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 to please them in a way or another so that they are a little bit more committed, engaged, etc. Et uh, so, for, for me, it's there is nothing really wrong. It's part of the model. Visualization is part of the model. The way you represent the information and what's happening is really part of the model. The only thing that matters is that at some point, it is the, the tricks are visible. And, mm -hmm. and this is a debate we had a long time ago, uh, and for some time we will have it. But I think that it's very important that at some point, the code is here. At some point, people realize that there is no magic. There is no trick happening. Uh, of course, nobody, not everyone is able to read code. Not everyone is able to write it. But Andrew is right. People are more and more um, trained on programming. They, um, and it's, yeah, they are changing too. Um, and, and I think it's really, really important that uh, we, we are able to to make sure that every time we show something, people can see the, the inner uh, parts and inner mechanisms uh, appearance. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, sorry, sorry I, uh, Alexis is coming about code and visualize it, making it simple and accessible. I think it's super important. And, you know, the analysis, one of the challenges a lot of people have with ABMs is understanding understanding them if you haven't created them yourself. And I know the visualization is super important. It goes back to like what Mandelbrot would have said, you know, if you're modeling spatial patterns, they have to look right. And, you know, that's where one visualization. But one of the challenges I've always had with ABM is if you look at a system dynamics model, you'll have the system dynamics diagram with stocks, flows, the linkages and things like that, right? While in the ABM community, you have UML diagrams 
and I know your computer scientists like oh look UML diagrams explain every you know in, but from a non computer science point of view UML diagrams are super hard to understand so is there an easier way to diagram out an ABM I still have never seen a good you know apart from just like simple flow charts is there a, a, a better way of doing it that's that that I've never seen and um well, I I'll leave that to the computer scientist to, to try to solve that problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I think it's a very good point. I think it's, it's, it's always difficult to explain what, how a model works and how to the, the behavior of the agents. And so, okay, you can have some codes, but uh, I, I totally agree with Alex. It's important to, to have the code to let the possibility to people to be able to at least uh, have a, know what is behind. But uh, you are right that communicating uh, the, the, just about the model is very difficult. And I don't know if you have something, some idea about that, Alexi and Arnaud or Andrew. I, I can, mm. ODD. <laughs> the, <laughs> ODD. <laughs> I mean, you only need 12 pages to talk about a, a small model. Right? So uh, ODD is perfect for uh, No, I, I think you're completely right, Andrew. One of the, main difficulties we have is that in order to um, let people know what's happening inside an ABM model, you have to show it running. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, uh, actually, as Arnaud said, uh, if you show it running, maybe you don't show everything, maybe you, you hide some part of the information, maybe you, you, you change a little bit the way, the way it, is, um, it, should be, it should be displayed. And there is no uh, agreement, as far as I know, on how we should represent uh, uh, what's happening inside uh, inside an ABM because UML it's okay for um, uh, for the static part uh, display and and I guess okay it's not very nice to read etc cetera, etc cetera, but at least once you have understood the basic principle it's okay for the static part uh, but the dynamic part is, is uh, completely agree it's very very complex just to, to my, my point, by the way, my point would be that if you are able to, to explain using a simple diagram what's happening in an ABM, then you don't need the ABM. Uh, because, point, yeah. because there is no point in running it. <laughs> if everybody can understand everything mm. and the interaction. So, so that's, I think it's part of the game, unfortunately, and probably one of the, yeah, one, one of the, Issues we, we may have, it's, it's become really mainstream as, well, as yeah. I think. To, to, to be a bit uh, on the opposite, if you have a, a nice visualization of your model, maybe you don't need a, a UML. So that's the, that's the challenge. But yeah, I would say one of the challenges is to have maybe more uh, models that, let's say, speak for themselves, where you don't have to explain for uh, 10 or 15 minutes in, in some presentation. And I don't blame anyone, it's how it is. You spend more time to explain the model, and then you might do the demo for, let's say, one minute. Uh, stuff are moving, and uh, so I think there is here some challenge to go back a bit in the topic of the of the talk, like how to to help to to see how to have this balance between a typical UML uh, presentation and a kind of self-explanatory model where you you just press run and everything understand uh, what's happening. Mm. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, we have to stop here because it's time. So it was very, very interesting. So thank you very much. So it was a very a pleasure to have uh, this discussion with you. It was uh, very, very interesting. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Andrew. It's quite, quite early for you, but uh, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank, you. thank you very much. Yeah, one so day. Long, but Actually, it was very short. I hope it was okay for the for the audience. But thank you, Andrew, for being here, and Alexi, of course. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to all of you, and uh, hope we can interact a little bit more in the future, Andrew. <laughs>